How big is this? Is this one that I can read or I have to write real big? Guys, could you see what Mr. Haddock wrote or was it too small? It was a little small. A little small? Okay, so we're going to bring it up a little bit closer to the whiteboard. Hopefully I don't trip Mr. Haddock. And then um, if you guys can't see that, you've got to let me know so I can make some adjustments as I'm recording, okay? Hi, Lane. Hi. Good to see you today, bud. You too, Miss Jay. We sent that. Oh, did he? So okay, so then we can print that in. See if we can. Okay. I'd rather get it. Okay. Are you logged in? When you start texting people and remind them to get on, I'll text Gerber. It's on, right? That's probably Joe. Joe, did you just log on with uh, Patrick on SpongeBob? Yeah, that's, wait, he's got two. Yeah, that's me. Okay. Joe, why, why are you on two times? Yeah, you're on two times, bud. Oh. <laughs> what, a, what in the world? And Abby's on. Yeah, I texted Kylie. <laughs> Garrett said he can't get on today. Garrett can't get on. Okay, well, I'm recording it, so we should. I should be able to send it out today after, afterwards. Then who else? Kylie said she couldn't get on either. Okay. Ooh, I'll text Matt. Yeah, Matt. And then anybody can talk to Parker or no? Yeah, I have Parker's number. Okay. Do you guys think we have everybody or no? What about Addy? I haven't heard from Addy or Matt. 
Okay. Or Abby. Abby's on. Oh, Abby's on. We got Abby. Okay. Yep. There's Abby right there. Okay. So Parker, um, Garrett, and Kylie could not get on, but I'm recording it so we could send it to them. Okay. Okay. This is Jensen. Yeah, honey. Jordan had some kind of like allergic reaction or something. So her eyes are swollen, so she can't see the screen. So if you could send it to her too, so she yeah. can it. Okay, we can do that then. So then, so everybody's accounted for then. Okay. The ones that we know aren't coming. Uh, okay. Okay, so you can go ahead and start. Okay, can you hear Mr. Haddock? Yep. Okay. I haven't said anything. How could you hear me? <laughs> okay, listen, let's. Uh, Jordan? That's Joe. He's messing oh. around with the screen. Okay. What we need to do is get some clean work done. How many of you have calculators? I do. Well, don't I do. For crying out loud, you got to say something. <laughs> I do. Okay. I do. Okay. We got to <laughs> figure out some way to get those back. So what I'd like you to do is to wipe those down as mm -hmm. best you can with wipes, sanitary wipes. And then just bring them to my house sometimes when you're in town. And if I'm not there, the door's open. So just take it in there and set it on the kitchen table or something. I'll find it. Okay. But we need to get those uh, graphing calculators back in. We won't need them uh, for the rest of the years. Are you telling me we have to do arithmetic in our head? Yeah, I know it's a pain, but uh, you know. That two times three is going to throw you off. <laughs> okay. The other thing is that I just talked to Mrs. Jensen. Uh, the state is requiring us to grade uh, the assignments now for the rest of the year. So those assignments have to be in. And the only one I've gotten so far on those first assignments that I gave you are Garrett's. So if you haven't sent those in, you need to send them to uh, lhaddock at parmaschools.org, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Take a picture of them and send them in. How many of you have them done? Or were you all lying last week? <laughs> I do. Okay. I do. Okay. And Sydney, did you get my answer to your question? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was just a matter of doing that arithmetic. That, yep. There's an extra two in there that you didn't see. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to be doing some creative licensing here for the rest of the year because we're going to talk about the second part of calculus. The first part of calculus is differential calculus using the derivative. And we found that the derivative was the limit of, of the uh, tangent line. It's the slope of the tangent line at a particular point. We found it by taking limits. And then we use that to find uh, maximum and minimum values. We use it to find rates of change. So it's used in a lot of different ways. The second part of, integral, of calculus is integral calculus. And that's what we start on. That's chapter number five on page 365. Okay. So if you have your book right there, let's go to page 365 because I want to I'm going to be doing this as simply as I can. It's not as simple as what it's going to appear to be, but it's going to work for us to, to finish out the rest of the year. So on page 365, uh, chapter number five says integrals. And if you read that, it says in chapter number two, we use the tangent to produce the derivative which is the central idea in differential calculus. In much the same way, this chapter starts with the area of the curves that we used last week and uses them to formulate the idea of a definite integral, which is the basic concept of integral calculus. So we will see in chapter six and eight, if we get to them, how to use the integral to solve problems. And the last sentence is the is the most important one, the last paragraph. There's a connection between integral calculus and differential calculus. 
The fundamental theorem of calculus that we'll talk about today relates the integral to the derivative. And we will see in this chapter that it greatly simplifies the solution of many problems. So those four problems that you had to do with finding the area underneath the curve, we're gonna do those again today, but instead of taking about 15 minutes per problem, it's gonna be take to somewhere around 30 seconds per problem. So you can see how that works. So we talked, we did the problems on page 366, talked about the rectangles going underneath that and so on and so forth. So like I said, I'm going to take creative license here. We're going to go to page uh, 378. And on page 378, these are the type, if you look at number one, it has the limit of, as n tends to infinity from i equals one to infinity of f of a function times delta x. That's what we used to do the problems last week, right? Well, if you look at number two, then they're gonna call the definition, there's a symbol like that. I don't know if you can read that, it's not the sloth drawn the, uh, the, the uh, bicycles, but that's called the integral symbol. And when you do the arithmetic involving the integral symbol, then that becomes integration. And that's what we're going to do. These two things are exactly the same. What we used last week to solve those four problems is going to be used this week under the integration symbol. So this is doing the rectangles and then adding them up. This does the same thing. You have delta x, you have dx. Same like you have a function, you have a function. We're going to integrate from A to B. Now, when we started the problems, we said that delta x, we had to find the distance between the two points. One of the first point was called A, and the second point was called B. That's what we have here. Called the integral. A and B are called the limits of integration. That's going to help us an awful lot. That's going to help us an awful lot to do the problems that we're going to have to do. So we've got those sitting down there. And so let's go to the properties on page. Uh, page 381. Excuse me, page 385, I'm sorry. Page 385. And at the bottom of the page, they have the properties of the integral. So if you have two functions, being added, and then you take you integrate, you can take them separate. That would be number two. If you have a constant in front of a function, you can take it out in front of the integral symbol. That's number three. If you have a subtraction, you can do it the same way you do an addition. That's number four. And we'll do enough examples that you'll be feeling pretty comfortable with it right away. Right? So on page 92 is where we're going to go to. It's like no one else even showed up. <laughs> and on page 392 is called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. Okay. It's hard to understand. <laughs> Sorry. 
That was my kids. Sorry. Are they okay? It's hard to understand with symbols. So we're going to try to put it in terms of words. Okay. And so if you look at that section, section 5.3, it says the fundamental theorem of calculus is appropriate name, appropriately named because it establishes a connection between differential calculus and integral calculus. Differential calculus comes from the tangent problem. And integral calculus comes from the area problem that we just did. Uh, somebody, Isaac Barrow, whoever he is, discovered that these two problems are actually closely related. In fact, he realized that differentiation and integration are inverse properties, inter inverse prop processes. So in other words, what was our last assignment on page 355? You had to find what? Antiderivatives. Antiderivatives. How many of them? Lots of them. Well, they found out that the, the fundamental theorem of calculus says that if you use integration, that's antiderivative. So even though it's a different notation, you're going to be doing exactly the same thing that you did for those assignments before. So I want to take a look at a couple of examples. And we'll talk about the fundamental theorem. And I'm going to write it in terms of words rather than write it in terms of symbols because I think the symbols get a little bit complicated. But we'll go ahead and try this. Now, once in a while, the book is just going to write it as FTP. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's in two parts. The first part says, and they put it in terms of symbols rather than words. The first part of the fundamental theorem is that the derivative and the integral are inverse processes. So when you integrate a problem, you're taking the antiderivative. So that's just a new, a new terminology. So we know how to take the antiderivative. We only have one rule. We can only add uh, one to the exponent and then divide by that new exponent. That's the only rule that we have. That's an that's a integral rule, antiderivative rule. The second part is that when you do integrate, When you do integrate and you find the antiderivative, then the answer to the problem is going to be the antiderivative of B minus the antiderivative of A. Now, remember when we started talking about antiderivatives, I said that capital F was just the, uh, the symbol that they use. So the capital F is the antiderivative. And so I'm going to show you actually how these are worked. And so you can see this a little bit easier. Can you get those down? Sid, can you guys see the picture? Yeah, I, I can see it. You guys are okay? You okay? Yeah.
Now, I just put four problems up there on the board. Can you see them? Yeah. Okay. And I use the terminology, find the antiderivative. So go ahead and very quickly find the antiderivative of these. Don't forget that every antiderivative has a constant. We'll make sure that you involve that with that. Okay with that. No, I, I can erase. Okay. So, Lane, what is the antiderivative of that first one? X cubed minus X squared plus 5X plus C. Okay. We have one rule and one rule only. We're going to add one to the exponent and then divide by that new exponent. And the second thing we'll do, add one to the exponent, divide by that new exponent. Same thing here. This is uh, five times x to the zero because x any number to the zero power is one. So when we add one to the exponent and divide by that new exponent, we get that. And then every problem has a constant. And then that was reduced. Lane just reduced it. So he, he said that the answer was x to the third minus 2x squared plus 5x plus c. Everybody agree? Yes. Yay or nay? Yes. OK. Now, how, how do you check it and make sure that you're right? Well, you take the derivative of your answer and you should get back to the original problem. Agreed? Yeah. Okay. Huh. Now I changed the problem and I rewrote it a different way. I said integrate it integrate this problem and the dx just means that you're going to do it in terms of the letter x you're not going to use the letter t or the letter y you're going to integrate this in terms of, of x and the answer to this problem is that it's done exactly the same way as the antiderivative no difference whatsoever So the antiderivative and the integral symbol are exactly the same. Okay, no difference. The second problem is we want to find the antiderivative of sine x. Well, we can't use the rule because there isn't one, but remember what is the antiderivative of sine x? Isn't it negative cosine? Negative cosine. So this is negative cosine x plus c. That's the antiderivative. If I wrote the problem this way, you get exactly the same answer. Absolutely no difference whatsoever. So the integral of sine x in terms of x is negative cosine x plus c. You have to use the antiderivative. What was the antiderivative of e to the x? Itself. Itself. Plus a constant. So if I integrate it, answer is exactly the same. And the last one, if we find the antiderivative, we add one to the exponent, divide by that new exponent, this one's going to create a problem for us because if we add one to the exponent, we get zero and then you can't divide by zero. So how did we take care of that? What's the antiderivative of X to the negative one? 
Natural log of X. Natural log of X. Well, this is two times the natural log of X plus five X plus C. And if I wrote the problem this way, exactly the same. Exactly the same. No different. Okay. Good to go. Yep. All right. Now we're actually going to add some limits to this. This is the lower limit, this is the upper limit. So to solve this problem, We're going to do absolutely exactly the same thing as we just did. We're going to take the antiderivative. Well, the antiderivative of this, and this dx just means we're using the letter x, is we're going to add 1 to the exponent, divide by that new exponent, add 1 to the exponent, divide by that new exponent, plus a constant. So when you integrate it, you're just taking the antiderivative. Now this 2 divided by 2 is just 1, so we're just going to have minus x squared. Now, if we actually give you numerical values, we're going to get a numerical answer for the problem. So they put a vertical line right after the, the uh, antiderivative, and we're going to integrate it from 1 to 3. Now, remember that if you look at that second uh, fundamental theorem of calculus, you had to take the answer in B, subtract the answer in A. So we're going to take the largest number, And we're going to do that arithmetic. And then we're going to take the smallest number. And do that arithmetic. And then we're going to subtract the two answers. Okay. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. You take the antiderivative, you put the number three in place of x, you put the number one in place of X and you subtract the two answers. And it looks like it's fairly complicated, but it's not because we just do a lot of cheating. You know, for example, uh, C minus C is going to cancel out. So the constant is gone. This is just 27 divided by three. That's just nine. And this is nine. And nine minus nine is zero. Okay. This is one third minus one squared, and it's negative. So this is a negative two thirds, and minus a negative two thirds is two thirds. So the answer to this problem is two thirds. Like I said, I'm taking creative license there. We're just gonna go right to the meat of the, of the way that it's worked. And you just do the arithmetic. If you want to do all of this first, and then all of this second, and then subtract the two answers, that's going to be fine. Won't hurt a bit.
if I remember right, um, this was the first problem that you had on those drawings problems. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How long did it take to do this problem step by step by step when we had to use the summation and add all of the rectangles together? Forever. Forever. Okay. Well, let's do it again. Okay. But we're not going to do it forever. We're going to integrate it from negative two to positive one. And we're going to integrate the function x squared plus two in terms of the letter x. And that's going to give us the area. So the antiderivative is x to the third over three plus two x plus c. The antiderivative of x squared plus two is this. We're going to integrate it from negative two to one. So put in the largest number first. If you put in the largest number one, you're going to have one third plus two plus C. Then put in the smaller number, which is negative two. So this is going to be negative eight thirds minus four plus C. And then subtract those two answers. So after you take the antiderivative, you put in the number one, the largest number, then you put in the number negative two, and then subtract them. C minus C is going to go to zero. This is one third minus a negative eight thirds. One third minus a negative eight thirds is a positive nine thirds, which is three. Mm -hmm. And two minus a negative four is a positive four. Or excuse me, a positive six. And the answer is nine. Now that was the answer we, we got, right? Yes. A little bit faster? A yeah, lot. a lot faster. A little bit faster. Now you'll get used to doing this again and again and again. Okay. Let's take that second problem that you have. It said find the area underneath the curve of, uh, I can't remember what it said. Uh, I've got it here. X minus one from two to seven. So we're gonna go from two to seven. X minus one is the function dx. Now probably one thing I should have mentioned that I didn't, we probably should graph these just like we did before. So if you put in the number two, you're going to get one. If you put in the number seven, you're going to get six. So I think we had that problem right there, didn't we? Yeah. Okay. So if I were to put in one rectangle, the distance from here to here, the width of this is dx. That's how wide it is. The height of this from here to here, this is x minus one. So you have the y value, times the x value. And then the integral sign is going to add every single rectangle from to infinity, starting from two going to seven. So antiderivative is x squared over two minus x plus c. We're gonna integrate that from two to seven. Put in the largest number first, you get 49 over two minus seven plus C. Put in the smaller number, you're gonna have four over two, which is two minus two plus C. Subtract those and you'll have your answer. Okay. So C minus C is gonna to go to zero. 
two minus negative or two minus two is going to go to zero. So you have 49 over two, which is 24 and a half minus seven, which is 17 and a half. What was the area when you did that by hand? Same thing. Makes it a lot faster, a lot easier. Now, one thing we didn't talk about that uh, we probably should mention real quickly here is can this answer ever be negative? No. Why not? Because we're taking the area of something. Okay. You're right and you're wrong. If I'm using this to find the area, you're exactly right. This answer has to be positive. But if I've just taken an integration, and if I put this, if I divide this up into rectangles, and divide this up into rectangles, and divide this up into rectangles, the area of each rectangle is base times height. So if you have base, times height, this is going to be positive because all of your y values are positive. And this is going to be positive because all of your y values are positive. But here, because it's below the x-axis, the y value from here to here is a negative value. And when you take a negative times a negative, you get a negative. So if you were going to add those up together, if the positive numbers add up more to the negative numbers, you'll get a positive answer. But if the negative area is bigger than a positive area, you're going to get a negative answer. So when you do find the area, we have to make an adjustment. Because area, the answer to an area problem, always, always has to be positive. So if we get a negative answer, we screwed up. So. If we're going to do a problem like this and we're finding area, then we're probably going to take the positive minus the negative, which would be positive. And that would give us a positive answer. But there's other ways to do that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. But they could be positive. Now, there's a great example of what that is at the bottom of page 392. Example number one. It says if f is the function whose graph is shown to the right and g sub x is equal to the integration from x to zero of f sub t dt, find the values of g sub zero, g sub one, g sub two, g sub three, g sub four, and so on, and then sketch a rough graph. Okay. Not that, not that too difficult. Okay, so we're going to have to go over a couple of, of things. Uh, I wanted to show you real quickly. If you look on page 385, in the middle of the page, it says that the uh, integrate from a to b of f of x dx, what happens if you turn a and b in reverse? If you put the negative number on top, <coughs> or the smallest number on, on uh, top and the biggest number on the bottom, then your answer is going to be negative. And then the other one is if you integrate from, zero to, from a to a, your answer is going to be zero. So if, you, if you're going to integrate from three to three, your answer is going to be zero. Seven to seven, the answer is going to be zero. Because when you put zeros in, those answers are going to be the same. Okay. 
So if you look at that drawing there that they have off to the left, it says they want you to find the values of G sub zero, G sub one, G sub two, G sub three, G sub four, and G sub five. Okay. <clears throat> so you have G sub X is equal to uh, A to the X, right? No, zero to the X. F sub T DT. <clears throat> now, F sub T DT is just the same thing as F sub X DX. So what we want to do is we want to, the first thing we want to do is we want to find this answer. That's the first one they wanted to find. So all they did was change this X to a zero. So if you're going to integrate from zero to zero, you're going to get an answer of zero. So this is zero. Sorry, guys. Miss Jensen, you're deafening me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> the next one they want is G sub 1. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to change that X to a 1. Okay. So now we're going to find the area under the curve from 0 to 1. So if you go to the graph, and if you go from 0 to 1, that's one space. And it's two spaces high, but it's in the shape of a triangle. Everybody see that? That first one? Yeah. Okay. Well, the area of a triangle is one half base times height. So one half, one times two is just going to be one. Okay. And they have it drawn at the top of page 393. They have it thrown as a picture, a really nice picture. G sub 1 equals 1 because the area of that blue region is 1. Then they want to find G sub 2. Well, that means we're going to change this X to a 2. So we want to find the area from 0 to 2. So they drew it there. That second picture at the top of page 393 for finding G sub 2. And all you're going to do is add the, the triangle plus the, the rectangle right beside it. So that's going to add up to three. The area of the triangle is one. The area of the rectangle is two. That adds up to three. Next one you find is G sub three. So we're going to change the X to a three. And now we're going to find the area from zero to three. Well, they have a perfect picture drawn up there on page 393. When you go from zero to one, you have that triangle. From one to two, you have that rectangle. And then you have from two to three. And you notice that's a curve line. So all they do is they just give you an estimate. They said from two to three, the answer is going to be, they're going to estimate that as 1.3. I guess I should have drawn this, but I didn't. Guys, can you see it? Yeah. So the first drawing was this. Very first, that one. That's this one here. And so the area there is one half base times height. So the area is one. Then they add this to it. So now you're going to go from zero to two. And now the area is this one plus these two squares. So you got an answer of three. Now they have this one. Now, this is not a true triangle because it has an arc. So they're saying that this area is slightly more than one. They're just estimating. This is one exactly. This is two exactly. They're saying this is 1.3. So now the area from zero to three is 4.3 because you're just going to add them together. Approximate. 
and then it goes down. I didn't draw this very well. But you notice they have this part of it in yellow. Okay? And if this part in yellow, this is negative because it's going to go below the x-axis. So when I go from g to 4, I'm going to put 4 for x. And so I want the area from 0 to 4. Well, if I go from 0 to 4, this is it. Now, these two areas are exactly the same, except this is negative and this is positive. So they're going to add up to 0. But when we go from 0 to 4, we got 1 plus 2 plus 1.3 minus 1.3. And that's going to put us back to 3. And finally, they put in g sub 5. So they're just going to, now they want you to find the area from uh, 0 to 5. Well, this, this is 1, this is 2, this is 1 point, this is negative 1.3. This is also negative 1.3. And the reason why these two are negative is because they're below the x-axis. So now you have 3 minus 1.3. This is approximately 1.7. So that's how they got the answers. They just did it by positive areas above and the negative below. So I just wanted to go through that because that's really a good problem. Okay. The last problem that we had on that assignment that I gave you. Mm -hmm. Is find the area under the curve, well, I think it was negative x squared minus 2x plus 1. No, plus 4x minus 1. And we wanted to find the area from uh, 1 to 3. So if I put in the number 1, uh, I get 2. If I put in the number 3, uh, what do I get? A number, I'm going to put in the number 2, excuse me. I get 3. If I put in the number 3, because we're going from 1 to 3, now I've just drawn a picture of it, I get 2. I know it's a parabola, so it's going to come this way. But we're only finding the answer from one to three. Now, I don't need to worry about making any adjustments to this at all, because you can see that the area is above the, um, the x-axis. So this is going to be positive. So I don't have to make any changes. There's no nothing but down below it. So I can just take the antiderivative, negative x to the third over 3, add 1 to the exponent, divide by that new exponent, plus c, and we're going to integrate it from 1 to 3. So if we put in the number 3, we're going to get negative 27 over 3. And we're going to get uh, 9 times 4 is 36 divided by 2 is 18 minus 3 plus C. So if you put in positive 3, you get those answers. If you put in positive 1, you get negative 1 third plus 2 minus 1 plus C. Subtract those two answers, because that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now you have your answer to the problem. So this would be, uh, this is 6. And C minus C is going to cancel out, because they're going to go to 0. So 18 minus 12 is just leave 6. 
this is going to be uh, two minus one is one. One minus a third is one is two thirds. And if you subtract those two answers, you get five and one third. And that was the answer that you got on that last program, or at least you should have got on that last problem. And I know that is confusing for right now, but all we're saying is instead of using the word antiderivative, we're using the symbol integral. Don't worry about the area problem so much is they're gonna take care of themselves when we start doing something. So I'm gonna give you an assignment. And it's gonna be on page uh, 400. If you look on page 400, I want you to do the odd problems. From 19 to 41. And then all of the problems from 45 to 52. And regardless of what the directions say, sketch it. Sometimes you can't. And then find the area underneath the curve. Uh, uh, for example, let's take a look at uh, problem number 49. Y is equal to the cube root of X from zero to 27. Let's draw a picture of that. So if you put in the number 27, the cube root of 27 is three. If you put in the number eight, the cube root of eight is two. If you put in the numbers uh, zero, the cube root of zero is zero. If you put in one, the cube root of one is one. So we're talking about this area here. It goes underneath that curve from zero to 27. Now you notice that everything is above the x-axis, so the answer is gonna be positive. So we're gonna integrate from zero to 27. We have x to the one-third. The cube root of x, we have to use exponents. So we're gonna add one to the exponent and divide by that new exponent. And we're gonna go from zero to 27. So if you add one to one third, you get one and one third, four thirds. And then when you divide by four thirds, you're gonna turn it upside down and multiply. Put in the number 27. If you take 27 to the four thirds, the cube root of 27 is three, and then three to the fourth is 81. So 27 to the four thirds power is 81. Plus C. Second part is easy. If you put in the number zero, this goes to zero plus C. Subtract, the C's cancel out. Your answer then is uh, just three times 81 divided by four. So 243 divided by four, 
60 and three fourths. So the area underneath this is 60 and three fourths. So if you could draw a picture, make sure you draw it. And you go from there. Let's see one more thing. If I remember right. I can't remember what page it's on. I got my lesson plan and then I can't remember what my lesson plan means. I find out. Okay, on, on page four oh three. At the bottom of page 403, everybody find it? Those are the tables that we use. You notice that there's two columns? Yeah. yeah. If you look at the third one down, that says add one to the exponent, divide by that new exponent. Agreed? Yeah. Okay, so that's just normal. That's just our normal antiderivative. The next one down, the anti or the integral of e to the x is itself. Next one down, the integral of sine x is negative cosine x. Next one down, the integral of secant squared is tangent. The integral of secant times tangent is secant. Uh, the integral of one over x squared plus one is arctangent. Don't do anything with uh, the hypersines, sine h and cosine h, forget those. But that just gives you a few more. The antiderivative or the integral of one over x is a natural log of x. Then you might want to remember this one when you integrate uh, a number to a power, then it's going to be the function divided by the natural log of the, of the base. And I think you have one problem like that. So your assignment is going to be uh, page 400. You're going to do the odd problems 19 to 41, and then all of the problems from 45 to 52. Okay. We're going to have these done uh, by Tuesday. And we're going to try to meet, if, if I can work it out with Mrs. Jensen, I'd like us to meet every Tuesday and Thursday uh, for the next five weeks. And then not, we'll have, we won't have an assignment every time, but that, that gives us enough time to take us where we could be, <coughs> where we could have been had we uh, taken our time and, and gone through the whole year. You got to remember one thing, this is only the seventh day that we're actually out of class because we had three before spring break and then this is the fourth one after spring break. So we've only had seven days out of school yet. So hopefully uh, we'll be back. I don't know whether that'd be in December or January, I have no idea. But sooner or later, we're gonna get back. But right now I want to get you guys to a point where you may not be able to take a test on this, but it's gonna be familiar to you, okay? Everybody agreed? Yeah. Okay. Now remember that according to the state, we have to take grades, so I need to get those assignments in. If you have any questions about this assignment on Tuesday, go from there. Otherwise, we're gonna continue and kind of get into some neat stuff, okay? Uh, how many of you guys are artists? Not me. Not really. Okay, good. One of the things that we will do is that we're going to ask you to draw some things.
So this is a function. And I want you to rotate that, rotate it around the y axis in your mind, and then draw it on this paper. So you're going to rotate that. So this point is going to rotate over to here. And this point is going to rotate over to here. And then that's what your picture should look like. Not very good, but I don't draw any better than you guys with all the numbers. Okay. Now, is that a cylinder? No. God. A cylinder is a tin can. That's not. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> with the use of integrals, we're going to be able to find the volume of that thing. Now take this same curve, now rotate it around the x-axis. Now it looks like that. Different shape figure. Now find its volume. And with integration, we're going to be able to do that. So we're going to do a lot of drawings like this, which I find fascinating. Because trying to watch you guys draw is kind of like watching you guys do arithmetic. <laughs> Painful. Okay? So we'll see you uh, next Thursday, same time. Or excuse me, next Tuesday, same time, 11 o'clock. Uh, get hold of those yahoos. No, I'm sure that's good excuses. He'll make something up. So kind of corner him if you can. And then, guys, um, Mrs. Kevin and I are going to try to figure out, one, how to share the recording out, and then, two, she's got a YouTube channel going for some of her students. We're going to try to put this recording on her YouTube as well. So you guys will still have access to it and be able to go back and watch it if you need it. Okay. And those guys who, who missed class today, they can see it as well, okay? Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mr. Attic. I know this is a pain in the tooth. We'll get through it. Don't forget those calculators. Yeah. Clean them, Sounds Mr. Attic, so you don't make him sick. Sounds good. Okay. Bye, guys. Have a good day. See ya. See you next Tuesday, okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I got to go check the printer. Right.